Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's mini webinar on the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act of 2019. Your audio was muted when you joined the call. Questions can be submitted via the question box on your screen. This session will last approximately 15 minutes, including time for a Q&A after the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and available on the PWSA USA YouTube channel. Effective advocacy is essential to ensuring the health, safety, and enhanced quality of life for those affected by Prader-Willi syndrome. As such, PWSA USA is committed to informing the PWS community of critical public policy issues to leverage the power of grassroots supporters to enact change. Because Prader-Willi syndrome is considered a rare disease, extra effort is needed to raise awareness amongst public and elected officials to guarantee the passage of legislation and regulations that help our community and defeat those that do not. I'm going to go through the next few slides pretty quickly, but don't feel like you need to take notes. After the webinar, you will be provided with a copy of this presentation, some key talking points, and a recording of the webinar. First, we'll cover a little bit about newborn screening, how states are involved in the newborn screening process, more about the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act of 2019, so the bill itself, and what you can do to help advocate for the passage of this legislation. So let's get started. Before we talk about the bill itself, let's talk a little bit about what newborn screening does. Newborn screening is one of the most successful public health programs ever enacted, saving thousands of lives over the past 50 years. Newborn screening allows physicians to catch rare genetic conditions early and start treatment almost immediately after birth. In this way, many of the worst effects of the disease can be mitigated. Additionally, all infants born in the U.S., regardless of race or socioeconomic status, undergo screening at birth. As one of the few quasi-universal public health requirements in the U.S., newborn screening mandates help reduce health disparities among infants of color. The map on your screen shows how each state's newborn screening program compares to the federal recommendation. Lighter colors represent less conditions and darker colors represent more conditions. States use the federal recommended uniform screening panel, also known as the RUSP, to inform their screening programs. These recommendations come from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. The RUSP now has 35 core conditions with reporting of 26 secondary conditions. As you can see, not all states screen for all 35 core conditions recommended at the federal level. This is because newborn screening programs are regulated and operated almost entirely at the state level, but supported by federal funding. States decide what conditions to screen for and what regulations should surround the newborn screening program, including mandated times to complete the panel analysis and the uses of blood spot data following the test. Here at PWSA USA, we support robust, well-funded newborn screening programs in every state, and we encourage state lawmakers to prioritize early detection of these conditions, including PWS. We encourage every state to adopt the Uniform Newborn Screening Panel, which will advocate, and we will advocate for this adoption in each state regardless. Um, whether the state screens for all 35 disorders or not, we want them to. So let's talk a little bit, a bit more about the bill itself. The Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act governs newborn screening at the federal level. The reauthorization of the Newborn Screening Act will bolster educational programs and clinical practices for newborn and child genetic screening. Additionally, the act will appropriate $31 million annually per fiscal year from 2020 to 2024 for certain programs and another $8 million annually to ensure laboratory quality and surveillance. It will also create a study by the National Academy of Medicine to understand the provisions of the current uniform screening panel and the process by which new conditions are added to the uniform screening panel. So what's in this bill that makes it so special? Most importantly, this bill reauthorizes grants to help states expand and improve their screening programs, educate parents and healthcare providers, and improve follow-up care for infants with a condition detected through newborn screening. It also reauthorizes the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children, which provides the states with a recommended uniform screening panel, that RSUP we talked about earlier, to help ensure that every infant is screened for conditions which have a known treatment. Additionally, the bill reauthorizes the Quality Assurance Program, which is the only comprehensive program devoted to ensuring the accuracy of newborn screening tests. It also reauthorizes the National Institutes of Health Hunter Kelly Newborn Screening Program, which funds research aimed at identifying new treatments for conditions that can be detected through newborn screening and develop new screening technologies. Finally, it directs the National Academy of Science to develop policy recommendations to modernize the nation's newborn screening system. You may have noticed when you signed up for this webinar that there were some numbers at the beginning of the bill. So let's talk a little bit about that. 
Each of the two sides of Congress, the House and the Senate, operate separately as bills are introduced by individuals in each of the two chambers. The person or persons introducing the bills are called sponsors. Representatives introduce House bills designated by the letters HR for House resolution, and senators introduce Senate bills designated by the letter S before the number of the bill. In the case of the Newborn Screening Reauthorization Act, the House and the Senate have introduced companion bills, meaning representatives from the House and senators from the Senate introduced almost identical bills to maximize the chance of success of the bill passing. It's important to note that in each case, in the House and in the Senate, they have two sponsors for the bill. In both cases, a Democrat and Republican in both chambers have co-sponsored the bill to make it truly bipartisan. In addition to the original sponsors, representatives and senators can show their support for the bill by, in their chamber by becoming a co-sponsor. By doing so, legislators are demonstrating their support for newborn screening to their colleagues. We want more co-sponsors for this bill because the number of co-sponsors is one measure of the likelihood of a bill being passed when it is brought to a vote. In 2008, Congress passed the original Newborn Screening Saves Live Act, which established the National Newborn Screening Guidelines and helped facilitate comprehensive newborn screening in every state. This act was first reauthorized in 2014. Back in 2007, before the bill was passed, only 10 states in D.C. required infants to be screened for all the recommended disorders. Today, all 50 states and the District of Columbia require screening for at least 29 treatable conditions, as recommended by the Department of Health and Human Services. Up on the screen, you can see the actions the bill has currently gone through. Right now, the bill is being held up in the HELP Committee. So we'll talk more about that on the next slide. Federal newborn screening programs expired last year on September 30th, 2019. The House has done its job passing their version of the bill in July 2019. Currently, the bill is held up in the Senate at the HELP Committee. The Senate bill is held up due to a proposed informed consent amendment that would require parents to opt in to allow their newborn's unidentified dried blood spot to be used for research, which would break down the entire newborn screening system. Public health laboratories and scientific researchers need these blood spots to conduct life-saving research to improve the current test and work to develop treatments for thousands of rare diseases still without a cure, which sounds great. However, complying with this amendment would place a high burden on hospitals that would likely choose not to participate in the collection of the dried blood spot. Studies have demonstrated that 90 to 99 percent of parents choose to opt into the program, but only half of the parents are asked by hospital staff due to the compliance burden. If you're interested in learning more about the Newborn Screening Informed Consent Amendment that is holding up the bill from being passed, send me an email after the webinar and I can send you more information about this key bill provision that's currently holding it up. So why is newborn screening important to the PWS community? There are a number of potentially devastating diseases that can be present in a newborn but hidden at the time of birth. These diseases, if undetected by newborn screening, have the potential to cause medical problems as the baby grows and severely alter the life of a child that could have otherwise been normal. Although PWS is not currently part of the newborn screening panel, the screening can rule out and or diagnose similar conditions that also present initially with low muscle tone and failure to thrive, reducing the instances of misdiagnosis and delayed treatment. Disorders are constantly being added to the newborn screening program and having a treatment option is one of the criteria to be added to being added to the panel. Um, right now, literally in the next hour or so, we're going to be verifying that growth hormone and behavioral therapies are considered the standard treatment option. So I'll send you more information following the webinar after we've confirmed this is the case. Another criteria is that testing for PWS must be economical. This key requirement for any new condition to be included in newborn screening. So we need a test that has high sensitivity and low cost. Thanks to several research studies, there is a strong case for including PWS into newborn screening programs as there are clear benefits for affected infants and their families through early diagnosis and intervention. Dr. Godler at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia has developed a sensitive, accurate, and cost-effective DNA test for detection of PWS and Engelmann syndrome using the dried blood spots obtained from all newborns. Dr. Godler's group will screen 75,000 newborn blood spots so that PWS might be incorporated into newborn screening, providing early diagnosis and optimal care for babies with PWS. Several researchers in the U.S. are also helping with the study or similar studies. So now that you know all about newborn screening and the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act of 2019, let's talk about how you can advocate for its passage on behalf of the PWS community. Sending an email or physical mail is one of the best ways to do it, and it's one of the most effective ways to reach out to your legislators. 
Your email or your letter will be more effective if you address a single topic or issue rather than a variety of issues that you feel passionate about. So in this case, just stick to newborn screening. A typed one-page letter is best. A physical letter is more likely to be read than an email, so if you can, try and find out their address and send them a letter in the mail. You can typically find an email or feedback web form um, and even a mailing address on your elected official's website. Sending an email to an actual person is far better than using a website form. So if you have trouble finding the best email or physical address, just give me a call and I'll try and help you find it as well. Make sure your letter is legible and try to make it stand out by including pictures or bright colors to make sure it gets attention and leaves an impact. If you're sending an email, don't include any attachments in your email as the staffer who you're sending it to might not be able to open it because it might get caught in a spam filter. Keep it brief, keep it polite, and try to keep it free of grammatical errors. Social media. So you're probably wondering if it can really be used for advocacy, and the answer is yes. Social media is a very public way to show your support or opposition to the policies or actions of your representatives. Not every elected official uses social media, but the ones that do are easily found by visiting their official websites. When posting, make sure that you tag their official page. Include a picture to increase the likelihood that others will read the text that goes along with it. Make it clear that you are a constituent of the elected official and make sure to make the post personal. Also be aware that any personal information will be visible to the public. You can also make a call to your elected official. It takes less than five minutes and is one of the most effective ways to advocate. Staff are dedicated to answering your phone calls and every call matters. Phone calls require minimal time commitment and no traveling. Every elected official will have a public telephone number that constituents can call to leave feedback. This could either be a place where you leave a voicemail or you talk to a staff member. You should only call your own elected officials and clearly state the address at which you are registered to vote so they know you are a constituent. Then you want to tell the staffer what it, or the elected official what it is you want them to do, why it's important, and why you feel motivated to call. In this case, you'd be calling about newborn screening and asking them to co-sponsor the bill in the House or Senate. Stay polite with the staffer on the phone, but be firm in your interaction as it will be short. You can also attend a town hall. Attending a town hall meeting is a chance to meet with your representative and get updates on what they've been doing. They are usually held in a public setting and free to attend. Town halls provide a fantastic opportunity to gain face-to-face -face access to your elected official. To find out when town hall meetings will be held, you can monitor your elected official's website and social media pages, sign up for email alerts, or call their office for event updates. In a typical town hall meeting, your elected official will speak for about 15 to 30 minutes about activities in Washington, D.C. Then they'll open up the floor to questions and constituents. Raise your hand immediately when they ask for questions. The longer you wait, the more competition you will have for the microphone. This is your opportunity to ask about um, newborn screening or other pieces of legislation that you are very passionate about. Make sure you have what you're going to say prepared in advance. You may only be given less than a minute to pose your question. So prepare a short summary of the bill or issue you're advocating for. Be sure to introduce yourself, state the bill number, the title, a summary, and what position you are advocating for and why. Your summary and explainer should be no longer than one page and only address this one bill or issue at a time. In this case, we obviously want you to encourage them to vote for newborn screening. If you aren't given a chance to talk to your elected official during the question and answer time, stick around afterwards and find a staff member. They can take your comments, answer questions, and refer you to appropriate staff members. Bring a business card or a printed letter about newborn screening to help them follow up with you. And don't forget to network with other attendees while you're there. It's a great way to get other people involved in the PWS community. You can also schedule a meeting with your elected official by visiting your local district office. It takes some planning, but it's the most impactful. You'll have a chance to sit down with a staff member from your local district office, or maybe even talk to them directly, uh, talk directly with your elected official. In order to schedule a meeting, you just need to visit the website of the person you want to visit. You'll be able to find a contact form or contact information for their scheduler or chief of staff, and then you'll find a section on the website usually that says request a meeting. If there's a web form to request a meeting, fill it out and someone will get back to you. Most state elected officials have district offices that are near your home address. You can ask to meet them at their district office so there's less travel involved. Or if you're going with a larger group such as your chapter and you want to advocate as a group, um, you could probably request a meeting at a local library or a town hall or another local venue to accommodate your group size. I really recommend doing it this way if you are going to try and schedule an in-person meeting because the more people present at the meeting, the more amplified your message will be. You can expect to spend about 10 to 15 minutes with your elected official, and it's not uncommon for them to have their legislative assistants hold the meeting instead. While the elected official may not be able to have a lot of time during the meeting, their staff are in a better position to dedicate more time to you and hear your position and address any questions and concerns. 
as with all the other ways of advocating, you want to make it short um, and simple. So make a short statement about your position, your ask, your personal story, and why you came to meet with them. Be clear with what you are asking them to do and stick to the issue you asked to discuss. If the conversation goes off topic, bring it back to the reason why you came and don't be afraid to press the staffer, the elected official, for a definitive answer or position statement in support or opposition of what you ask. In this case, you want to get a firm, yes, I will support newborn screening in our state. You also want to ask the elected official if they'll pose for a photo with your group and if everybody can um, be photographed as well. Then thank them for their time and meeting with you in support of the PWS community. PWSA USA has prepared some boilerplate text for you to use, so we encourage you to personalize your emails, tweets, phone calls, and letters using this template. Um, these templates are our guide to help you make your point and use your own words to make it more personal. Thanks for attending. We're right at 17 minutes, so a little bit over time. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them via the question box on your screen. While you're typing out your questions, I also want to remind everyone that PWSA USA is a 501c3 organization. So when you're meeting with your representatives on behalf of PWSA USA, keep in mind you're not lobbying, you're educating your legislators about issues that are important to you. This is so we don't jeopardize our tax exempt status. I also want to take a moment to encourage everyone to register to vote, check your voter registration status, and turn up at the polls this November. When we talk to our elected officials, we want to be able to say that 100% of the PWS community votes. If you need help finding out your voter registration deadlines in your state or voting times and locations, whether or not you're even eligible to vote and register, give me a call and I'll help you through the process. With that, um, let's see if anybody has any questions. So we have a question from Josh up in Wisconsin. Since he represents a chapter and not himself, how would I approach representatives outside my home area and in my state? So in your case, Josh, you'll just want to say that you're speaking on behalf of PWSA Wisconsin. Um, let them know that you are representing the chapter. If you can get more chapter members to come with you, if you're doing an in-person meeting or um, anything like that. You can even have people sign like a letter all together. There's a lot of organizations that do this, like the um, NORD organization, National Organization for Rare Diseases. They maybe have a piece of legislation that they support and then they'll list all of the organizations under them that also support the legislation. So in your case, you can maybe say from PWSA Wisconsin and then list your board members or list members of the PWSA Wisconsin chapter who support the legislation. Um, where do you access the templates? I will send you all some copies of templates and boilerplates. I also want to take a second to show you all um, our PPAC website. Let me see if I can pull that up. Um, an e another easy way to advocate, and I will send this to everybody on the call today, is to go to our um, public policy and advocacy website. Let me see if I can get that to show up on my screen. Um, I think you all can see it now, but I'll send you the link to it. But it's a very quick and easy tool that we have where you can take action on the six items that we are pushing at the federal level. Um, so in this one, newborn screening, you hit take action now. And it'll take you to a little bit about newborn screening, why it's important. And then here you fill in your information and it'll automatically put in your representative's information. And then from here, it's got a template email that will send right away. Um, so that's one easy way to do it where you don't even have to search down their information. You just fill this out and it automatically sends it for you. But I will provide templates for if you want to call or ask for a meeting in person, or if you want to send your own email, not through this form. Um, has PWSA connected with the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates? Yes, we are very connected with RDLA and um, the Every Life Foundation. Stacey Ward, our Director for Family Support, recently went to the Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill back in, I believe it was late February or early March, to speak with the rest of the um, rare disease community on issues that are important. So we are very involved in the Rare Disease Legislative Act advocates and Every Life Foundation, and I'll send you all information about that organization as well. They're fantastic, and they're kind of the advocates for the rare disease community at large, not just PWS. 
Um, with that, I don't think we have any more questions. So thank you all for attending. Um, I really hope that you're able to come to the next couple of webinars on all of our issues. If you have any questions, please give us a call or an email. My email is alucy at pwsausa.org, or you can email the info at pwsausa.org up on your screen as well. Thank you, everybody.